Hi everyone. Today we're going to talk about kinematics, a branch of physics that involves accelerated motion. What is accelerated motion? It's anytime something gets faster or slower. We have a million interactions with objects every day that involves acceleration, and so that means this topic involving acceleration is going to be something that applies to a lot of things in your everyday life. It also applies to things like video games that are designed around physics, for example, Angry Birds, one of the more popular kind of early app games for iPhones and iOS. Uh, that game completely relies upon kinematics to help you determine where the projectile of the birds are going to end up on the other side of the map. So other than video games, what is this good for? Well, anytime that you're moving through the world, it's likely that you're accelerating to some degree, even slightly. So what is acceleration? Well, again, it's a change in velocity over time. So as you can see in the example with the skateboarder, every time you look at them, they're getting faster and faster and faster as they roll down the ramp. That's an example of acceleration. Acceleration, again, is a change in speed or velocity as time goes on. It can be caused by things like gravity. If you drop something out of your hand, it's going to get faster and faster and faster until it hits the ground. Driving in a car and feeling someone hit the accelerator, having the wind blow near you, or just having somebody punch you in the face. Those are all examples of acceleration. So what are we going to learn about in this unit? Well, kinematics, again, is a branch of physics that deals with objects that are accelerating. And they can accelerate in any number of dimensions. The one that we're going to be focusing on the most is just the first dimension, which means going forwards, backwards, or left and right, or up and down. Here's an example down below. You can see that this archer is shooting an arrow forward. And before he shot it forward, he had to pull it backward. So backwards and forwards are the only two important directions here, so we consider that just one-dimensional. As you can see on the right, a student is throwing a ball up in the air and it's traveling upward. Then as gravity takes its toll, it forces the ball to move downward. So up and down are the only two important directions there. Therefore, this is one-dimensional, just up and down. And then finally, in the top left-hand corner, there's a race car speeding off forward into the distance, and forward and backwards are the only important directions in this case. So all three of these are different types of one-dimensional motion, and that's what we're going to be thinking about in class primarily when we talk about kinematics. You can get into two-dimensional kinematics and even three-dimensional kinematics, but that's a little more advanced than what we need to talk about today. So in kinematics, what kind of tools are we going to use? Well, there's a set of five variables, first of which is displacement. What is displacement? Displacement is the distance from your starting point to your ending point. It's how far you got, or as the crow flies. VI is another variable used in kinematics. It stands for initial velocity. It's how fast something is moving at the start of its journey. VF stands for final velocity, and it means how fast you're going at the end of your journey. T stands for time. It takes some amount of time to speed up or slow down, and so time is obviously going to be relevant here. And then, of course, the variable at the end that will tie all of this together is A, which stands for acceleration, which, of course, means getting faster or slower as time goes on. So now that we know the five variables that are involved in kinematics, what do we do with them? Well, you'll primarily be using them in what we call kinematic equations. Kinematic basically just means motion. So a kinematic equation would be an equation that you use to predict motion. Specifically, these four equations will be useful for predicting the motion of an object that is either speeding up or slowing down uniformly. Uniformly is a fancy way of saying constantly or always the same way. So what's the first kinematic equation? And it's only listed first because it's the most common one. It's this one. It says x equals vi times t plus one half times a times t squared. You might recognize those variables. They're the ones we saw on the previous page. x stands for displacement. vi stands for initial velocity. T stands for time, one half, well, that's just a number. A stands for acceleration, and T again stands for time. Now that might be a little strange because we already saw time earlier in that equation, and usually you only see a variable pop up once per equation, but in this case it pops up twice, and it happens to be squared at the end. Pretty weird. So what's the second kinematic equation? It's this one. It looks a little simpler. VF equals VI plus A times T. VF stands for final velocity. VI stands for initial velocity. AT stands for acceleration multiplied by time. The third kinematic equation is this one. VF squared equals VI squared plus 2 times acceleration times displacement, 2AX. And finally, the fourth kinematic equation, the one you'll probably use the least frequently, is this one. 
x equals vi plus vf divided by 2 multiplied by t, or displacement equals initial velocity plus final velocity divided by 2 multiplied by time. These four equations are going to be your main tools that you use in order to solve real-world problems. You can literally predict the future using just these equations. Pretty awesome. So, what's it going to look like when you use kinematic equations in order to solve problems? Here's an example of what those problems will look like. Practice problem number one. Calculate the final speed of a rocket car that starts from rest and has a constant acceleration of 15 meters per second squared over a measured distance of 175 meters. So the first thing you can notice in this problem is that they use the word acceleration. As soon as you see that word, that's an indication that you can use one of the four kinematic equations to solve this problem because kinematic equations are good for acceleration. So, here are those four kinematic equations at the top. We're probably going to end up using one of these in order to solve our problem. But we're going to have to do a lot of thinking first before we put any numbers into our calculator because this could get very confusing very fast if we don't organize our work. So what's the first thing I'd recommend doing here? Well, right now, I'm kind of a visual learner, and I don't really do well reading long paragraphs of text in order to understand something. So even something as short as this one-sentence problem might seem kind of challenging at first. You might not really know what it's saying or what it's asking you to do. So I like to draw a picture first. Here's a picture of the rocket car that they're talking about. And in this problem, the rocket car starts from rest, which means it's not moving at first, but then it accelerates. So maybe we could draw over here a little flame coming out of the back. And then after that flame or explosion happens in the back of the rocket car, it starts to speed up and get faster and faster and faster. So what do we know about this situation? Well, we know a few things. We know that it starts out with no velocity because they say it starts from rest. From rest is a fancy way of saying not moving. So I can assume that the initial velocity of this rocket car is zero meters per second. Can I assume anything else? Well, yes, I can assume that the acceleration of this rocket car, as a result of the rocket on the back, is 15 meters per second squared. Now, what does that really mean? What is that 15 measuring? Well, it's measuring how many meters per second of speed it gains every one second. It's really meters per second per second. And it just gets shortened to meters per second squared. So that's something about the rocket. It's the rate at which it is speeding up. Is there any other information in the problem that they tell us? Well, yes, they tell us the distance that the rocket car travels throughout its journey. It goes a total distance of 175 meters. Here's a question. Is there anything that we don't know about this scenario? Well, yeah, there's one or two things I could probably identify. Number one, we don't know how much time this process takes. This rocket car could accelerate to its final speed in five seconds or 30 seconds or two hours. Not really sure what that time is. And also, we don't know, well, the thing that they're asking for in this problem. We don't know the final velocity of the rocket. VF stands for final velocity. And they said, calculate the final speed of the rocket car. So that's what we're going to need to find out. Um, it's true that we don't know time, but they're not asking for that. So I'm not going to worry about the fact that I don't know how much time this takes. That's probably not going to be that important for me to find out. So let's just focus on finding VF. Okay, so now that I've made this whole picture here, this didn't really get me my answer, but it might have helped me to identify what this problem is talking about and what it's asking for. Just wrapping your head around a problem at the very start is sometimes the hardest part for people. The first real step to solving a kinematics problem is to write a list of all of your known and unknown variables. What are those variables and how many are there? Well, remember that there's five. There's x, displacement, vi, initial velocity, VF, final velocity, T, time, and A, acceleration. We happen to know what most of these things are from the diagram that I drew above. That might help you to kind of know which numbers match with what information. And because I did all that thinking up above, it's going to be pretty quick for me to fill this info in. Here's what I know. I know that the displacement of the rocket car is 175 meters. I know that the initial velocity of the rocket car was zero meters. I don't know how fast it's going at the end, so I just put a bunch of question marks for VF. And I also don't know how much time this process took, so I just put a bunch of question marks again. But I do happen to know the acceleration of the rocket car, the rate at which it's speeding up, and that's 15 meters per second squared. So that's my first step done, and believe it or not, that's actually the most important step in my opinion, and that's because once all of your data is listed out here, you don't actually have to go back and look at the problem or your diagram basically ever again. 
all the information that's relevant to finding your answer that you're looking for is now down here in this list. So that's pretty sweet, and that's the benefit of listing out all your data here is you never have to look back and read anything again. So here's step two. Step two of solving a kinematic equation is pretty fun because you get to make a decision, which makes you feel pretty important, and that decision is which kinematic equation are you going to use. You want to pick one that has all of your known variables in it, and one that also has the desired unknown variable in it so that you can solve for it. So which of these four equations up above matches our requirements? Well, what are our known variables? Well, we have x, vi, and a. So x, vi, and a, uh, x, vi, and a, x, vi. Okay, so it seems like it's going to be one of these two. And our equation that we choose also needs to have the unknown variable. Well, in this question, we're being asked to calculate the final speed. So that's vf. So that's our desired unknown variable. We actually have two unknown variables, but only this one is considered the desired one because the question is asking about it. We're not going to worry about the fact that we don't know time. So which of these two equations has all of the ingredients that we need? Well, since we're trying to solve for VF and therefore it needs to be in our equation, we've got to go with this third equation. So da 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 da, that's our kinematic equation. Now I'm going to write that kinematic equation down because I like to show all my work in physics to get full credit and such, um, and just to have evidence of where my answers came from. And instead of just writing it all out in red, I'm highlighting here what my unknown variable is. And here's why. This equation isn't actually set up to solve for the thing that I need. I want to calculate the final speed of the rocket, but this equation doesn't solve for final speed. It solves for final speed squared. So here's the next step I need to take. Step three is to use algebra, or math, to rearrange the equation so that it directly solves for the desired unknown variable. That's pretty heavy, but that basically just means make this vf squared turn into just vf. Isolate the variable, get it by itself. So how do you get rid of a squared? Well, from your math class, you probably know that squared is the opposite of square root. So we're going to square root this side of the equation. And then to be fair to this side of the equation, we're going to square root this whole side as well. And that's going to look like this down below. The left side of the equation, after you apply a square root to it, becomes just vf, which is great because that's the unknown variable we're hunting for. And then the right-hand side becomes vi squared plus 2ax, but with one big old square root over it. So that's step three done. We're now ready to use this formula and plug in the things we know. That brings us to our final step, step four. Plug in all known variables and solve for the unknown variable and include a unit at the end that's correct and appropriate. So here's our math. Vf, the final velocity of the rocket car, is equal to the square root of zero squared, which is kind of a weird math thing to do, but if you look over here, vi squared is our first operation we should be doing, and that's zero because it started at rest, plus two times 15, because 15 was our acceleration, that's the rate at which the rocket car was accelerating, multiplied finally by 175, which was the displacement of the rocket car throughout this journey. All right, now the fun part for those of you who love calculations. Put all these numbers together in your calculator, square root everything, and the final result that you'll get will be 72.5. And what does that mean? It means that at the end of its journey, after it had been speeding up 15 meters per second squared for a some amount of time, the final speed that it reached was 72.5 meters per second. And that's how you solve a kinematics problem. The last thing you would typically want to do is think about, is my answer reasonable? Is this an answer that makes sense? Now, since our speed started at zero, and every second we were gaining 15 meters per second squared, it kind of makes sense that after a few seconds, it would build up from zero speed to 15 to 30 to 45, and eventually we'd make our way up to some number hovering around 72.5 meters per second. So yes, I'd say that's a reasonable number. In the next video, I'll give you guys three more examples of how to use kinematic equations and how to calculate your final answers. See you in the next one.